Okay, so as a general introduction, um, we say in the Talmud, it says to love the Lord your God and to serve your God with all your heart, right? Which we all know from the Shema, what is the service of God that is in the heart? You must say that this is prayer. In other words, prayer is the service of the heart. Um, and meaning it is supposed to both be from the heart and to, in some ways, transform or impact our hearts, right? Impact ourselves. Um, in the words, of Rabbi Sachs, he says, prayer changes the world because it changes us. So my focus during this class is going to be how prayer, um, how prayer can, can be a transformative experience. It's often difficult and doesn't always feel like a transformative experience, but um, basically what I want to do is to look closer at the words of prayer and at the different parts of the prayer service as a way of helping us and seeing how reconnecting to prayer as the title says to see how the how to try to explore how the experience can be more transformational um in the words of rabbi sex um so but as i said today we're not so much going to be going to be doing a normal class um and we're going to talk instead about prayer obviously connected, but prayer in a time of distress. What do we do now over the patent, the horrible, horrible events of the last two weeks? Can we express it in prayer? Um, if so, how? Uh, if not, what do we do if it's hard, even hard to pray at this, at this time? Um, so I want to start off. So just to warn those of you who have not we're not with us and have not been with us. And I like to try to make this class as participatory as possible, um, including if people are willing also to read the sources and are be asking questions and I want, really want to hear from you. So if anyone is space that they can turn on their video, those of you who, um, uh, that would be great. Um, though you're welcome to talk also without a video. Um, so we're going to start with a famous Nachmanides, which is Rambam and Ramban, about prayer and the nature of prayer. Um, so does someone want to read the, I know you haven't gotten the source sheets, but you can see it here. Does someone want to read the first, the source, um, the first number three, Maimonides, Mishnah Torah, Laws of Tefillah? You can just like raise your hand or, un or unmute yourself. <laughs> Yes, my mother. That's my mother to for all who might not realize the similarity in name. Yeah, go ahead, Mel. It is a positive Torah commandment to pray every day, as Exodus 20 through 25 states, you shall serve God your Lord. Tradition teaches us that this service is a prayer, as Deuteronomy eleven thirteen states, and serve him with all your heart. And our sages said, which is the service of the heart? This is prayer. Okay, so Maimonides says there is a, a mitzvah from the Torah, a commandment from the Torah to pray every day. And we learned that from this verse that we saw, that we just saw in the Talmud. You shall, um, the Talmud is quoting the verse from the Shema, you shall serve your God and serve him with all your heart. Okay, so nah, so this seems to be like a pretty, you know, normal read of what we just saw in the Talmud, uh, straightforward read. Um, okay, but Nachmanides disagrees. Uh, you want to keep going, Mom? That next source for. Okay, but this is not correct because the sages have already explained in the Gemara that prayer is a rabbinic obligation. The entire concept of prayer is not obligatory at all, hmm. but is one of the merciful attributes of the Creator that He hears and responds whenever we call unto Him. Rather, the mitzvah is that we pray to God in times of great distress and that our eyes and hearts turn to God as the eyes of servants turn to their masters, as it is written. When you are at war in your land against an aggressor who attacks you, you shall sound short blasts on the trumpets that you may be remembered before your God and delivered from your enemies. Um, Numbers 10.9. It is a mitzvah to plead fervently with God through prayer and Trua, shofar blasts, whenever the community is faced with great distress, or as a mitzvah to affirm in moments of distress our belief that the Holy One listens to prayers 
and intravenous breath aid. Okay, so does anyone, did anyone get here? How, how is Nachmanides Ramban disagreeing with Maimonides? What is his, Maimonides said that there is a Torah commandment of prayer and what is Nachmanides saying? Anyone can just, um, I can't miss this. I'll say yeah, go ahead. It's, it's rabbinic. It's from the rabbis later on. That made right. That. It's rabbinic. And what is, and what is the Torah commandment? Not, not prayer in general. The prayer in general is rabbinic. What's the, what's the Torah commandment? That you pray every day. Who's um, speaking? Sorry, I can't see. That's Susan. Um, Susan? Susan Feynman? Is that who's speaking? No, I'm no, not Nancy. going to, but that Nancy. I'm Nancy. It's Nancy. I can't see. Oh, okay. Nancy, sorry. Nancy. Okay. Do you recognize my voice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're speaking. For, okay. I can't see. You don't have your video, so I can't see. Okay. Sorry. I guess I, yeah. Okay. Totally so, so, sorry. What were you saying, Nancy? No, I was just saying that the rabbinic you know, came later that they say, so it's not so much a mitzvah, a, a, mm -hmm. a Torah mitzvah, but it's a rabbinic. Right, with, exactly. With, and what um, is, but there is a Torah mitzvah. What is the Torah mitzvah? Oh, from the Yehafta, that you shall. No, so according to Nachmanides, and it's not totally clear, but he says, rather the mitzvah is, meaning now he's talking, what is the Torah commandment? Is that we pray to God in times of great distress. Oh, of distress, right. Yeah, exactly. So for him, prayer in general is just a rabbinic mitzvah meaning it's like, it's something that God, he says, one of the merciful attributes of the creator that he hears and responds whenever we call into him. In other words, like, it's just sort of like a, a gift out of God's mercy that he, um, that he has us pray, but it's not an obligation per se. But what is an obligation is to pray in times of great distress. Um, the eight Sarah, that's the Hebrew, right, that I was saying before. Um, and specifically, the example he gives here, the verse that he's talking about, right, is exactly at our situation right now. When you're at war in your land and against an aggressor who attacks you, you shall sound short blasts on the trumpets that you have maybe remembered before your God and be delivered from your enemies. Okay, so he's like giving our situation now is sort of like the archetypical prayer, right? Like this is like for him, like what it means, like what the biblical commandment is. Um, so where, like, what do you think? Um, yes, other, <laughs> wait, other Susan Gelfman, who, who is that? that? Your thing says Susan Gelfman, but you're not Susan Gelfman, who's raising your hand. Hi, your parents sent me the link, that's why. I, I'm <laughs> Janice Monette. Yeah. Janice? Uh, Janice, yes, Rachel. Okay, nice so, to meet uh, you. Thank okay, you. Okay, go ahead, yeah. yeah. I was thinking about when Esther called for everyone to pray mm. for the, in mm. the three days, to fast and to pray because of the decree. So right. That, that would be another example. Back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That would be another example of uh, what Nachmanides would call, right? What Ramban would call the biblical, the biblical prayer, right? And when Esther, really also in great distress, the, like now, right, the Jews are in danger of um, being killed. And, and she calls, you know, she calls out in great distress, Esther, and she calls on everybody, right, to, yeah, so that's also a really good example. Um, so what do you, like, what do you guys think? What is the, what's the basis of this argument? In other words, why does Maimonides think that prayer in general is the Torah mitzvah? And Nachmanides think that, that, uh, was the chat? Oh, good. You, they also sent, if you guys saw, Kayla also sent the source sheet out on the chat. Um, and Nachmanides think that the Torah mitzvah is just prayer in times of great distress. Like, what, are, what do you think they're arguing? What are they both saying about the nature of prayer? How are they, how are they different? Like, what do you, what do you think they're trying to say? Or what's the basis of their disagreement, do you think? Any ideas? What? Um, it's yeah, Susan. Janice. Um, but you are Susan Feynman. Janice, though. <laughs> yes. Good. Um, yeah. You know, this is not. This is just a general, uh, from more of a general perspective. It's one is a, a as a as something that you do daily. It's a, it's a habit. You do it right. 
And it's mm -hmm. something that you you understand and you just do it all the time versus the other um, doing it at times of distress. It's a reaction to yeah. something that's right. happening. Right. Um, and the Nachmari seems to be saying that that kind of like gut, like instinctive reaction, right? That's like what the real essential prayer is, right? Right. Yes. Right. Whereas Nachman, whereas Maimonides is more saying, like you're saying, like the everyday prayer, like that's that's like the real, like the essential prayer is what we do every day. Right. Um, it almost it almost makes it perhaps um, I don't know, more important, but more special not necessarily positively special, but special because we're reacting to a situation and it's more unique. If you don't do it daily, then it's more unique to what you typically would do because yeah. you're under distress and you're, you're using this um, platform, this method, this um, way to talk to, do to, talk to God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like, and this unique experience he's saying is like the, like, hopefully we're not all the time in great distress. I mean, that's hopefully not a usual situation, right? But that, that is really like the essence of prayer. Um, Janet Aronson, did you, I can't see you, but I see your, I see your hands raised. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put on my camera for a second. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, right. So I, I think um, in addition, another difference is about what the purpose of the prayer is. And yeah. this is clearly asking God for immediate help. And we know there are lots of other purposes of the prayer. So in daily, regular prayer, there is praise yeah. and there's gratitude and there is, you know, I don't know. Well, I guess what, that's what we'll learn about all those right. other reasons. But this is a very specific one, which I think is also kind of challenging because it wa it's one that um, is asking for a specific immediate response from God right. that, you know, we're going to then see if it comes or not. Right, right. Like he says at the end, it is a mitzvah to affirm in moments of distress our belief that the Holy One listens to prayer and intervenes to grant aid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, obviously, in real life, it's not always so clear, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, mm -hmm. so we will obviously talk about this, like there can be a, many reasons we pray, even if we don't. We don't necessarily believe that, you know, the more we pray, the, you know, God's going to answer us directly or, you know, real life is a lot more complicated, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, like he's saying, prayer is this asking for an immediate response when we're in distress, right? And it's, and you're right, we will be talking about the other kind, originally this class was actually supposed to be about the morning, uh, you know, the morning blessings, which is all about praise and giving thanks. Um, and there are a lot of other reasons that we pray, but he's saying it, but that this kind of like asking and asking and like, you know, existential, like in like real distress is like the essence. Uh, yeah, Janice. Mm -hmm. um, when I lost my sibling, um, I found prayer, just the daily regular prayer, very comforting in its continuity in its regularity in, in its permanence so yeah. that there's that aspect as well um right. but there's a joke that uh, kind of amplifies or ex exemplifies what you were saying about when we pray um a a minister um dies and goes to heaven and uh he uh, he's not given very royal robes to enter the promised land. He's given rags and he goes into the gate and then a taxi driver comes and he's given golden robes and a scepter and, and he passes through the pearly gates and the minister says to God, God, every week, you know, I, I shared your, um, you know, what, what you're all about and your essence. And I, I gave talks about it. Why do I get the rags and a taxi driver gets, you know, mm -hmm. the, the uh, royalty and God answered, when you spoke, everyone slept. When he drove, everyone prayed to me. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but going back to the beginning of what you said, right? That there is, 
also in times of crisis and times of mourning, right? We're not quite, I think we'll get to this, like, I think like here in Israel, the Jewish people in general are only like very much beginning the mourning process or at like the very, you know, not even like beginning in many cases, like the bodies aren't buried, like people don't know yet whether they're, you know, but but once we get to that point of the morning, that there is also something very valuable in the regularity that mm -hmm. that Maimonides is emphasizing, that that can also be a very comforting thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, my mom, I see, is raising her hand, or my dad. I don't know. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, to go back to what Janet says, maybe it isn't whether God um, does what we want him to do and intervene. Maybe it's more as Rabbi. Zach says that the prayer changes you, that the belief gives you hope. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, right, it's the prayer of the heart. Like it's about our hearts ultimately, right? Like whether, even if we don't necessarily know whether God will answer us, like there's something in, maybe because it gives us hope, maybe because we just, and we'll, we'll talk about different options late, uh, as we continue in the class, maybe because it gives us hope, maybe we just need to say it <laughs> like just to scream it to ask you know just to cry out um but like something about hopefully like the something about expressing in prayer if we can even we'll also talk about that question is transformative to ourselves um it's, did, i think did one hey, more Jill? person have their hands yeah yeah Nancy. i can't oh, find Nancy. my raise I can't find my raised hand on my screen for some uh, reason. Okay, yeah, it. go ahead. And then, and then anyways, yeah. one thing that strikes me is a difference I noticed between Maimonides and um, who's the other one we're talking about? And Nachmanides, Rambam and Rambam. Uh, Nachman, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank. You. Oh, Rambam, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Is that this in the second one about the mitzvah about um, when there's distress? But he specifically says whenever the community is faced with yeah. Christmas, a distress versus the other one was is more individual mm -hmm. um private prayer and yeah. i think that might be an important piece of it as well for that sure yeah and that's a very good point right like here he could have given an example and i mean there are other examples but he could have given like the example he's given here is a very communal example it's not a personal there's obviously yeah. numerous, many times when people are in personal distress, but the example he gives is like a communal distress, which presumably, which makes a very different kind of prayer also when we're, right. we'll also talk about that, but when we're, um, yeah, when we're praying for the community and not just for ourselves, I mean, also for ourselves, but also for the community that like changes. Um, Janice, and then I want to keep going because we have a lot of sources to do, and this is just the beginning. So yeah, go ahead, Janice. That's I've heard sometimes God says the answer is no. Also, right. That's mm -hmm. also very important to say. Yeah. yeah. That God hears us. Right. Right. This is one way of understanding prayer. God always hears us, right? If but he doesn't always say yes. Yeah, right. exactly. But that there can still be a value, right? And like asking Absolutely. The question, even if of the answer is no. I mean, we hope it won't. Okay. So but I do want to acknowledge, and this is another question that we're going to be going through, is that sometimes in like, especially in like the most immediate forms of crisis, it's like praying itself can be a very hard thing to do. Um, so we're also going to talk about that. So what I want to look do now is to look at the story of Jacob um, um, when he's encountering, he's coming back after um, you know being away for for however many years many years um, when, after he fled from Esau because he thought Esau was going to kill him right and he's coming back and and he's scared he's very scared he sees what we're about to see he sees there are 400 400 uh, people and he doesn't know whether Esau Esau still wants to kill him or not and he's very scared and we're going to look at his at his prayer but not only at his prayer i want you to pay attention as we're reading and we'll talk about it in, after we finish reading it is he has a few different responses and prayer is only one of the responses so i want someone to like and it's interesting also the order um so can someone can someone read the passage from genesis of jacob 
Yeah, Janet. Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, and instructed them as follows. Thus shall you say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I stayed with Laban and remained until now. I have acquired cattle, asses, sheep, and male and female slaves. And I send this message to my Lord in the hope of gaining your favor. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau. He himself is coming to meet you and has written you numbers of 400. Jacob was greatly frightened and his anxiety, he divided the people with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, the other camp may yet escape. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham's house, and God of my father Isaac's house, O Hashem, who said to me, return to your native land and I will deal bountifully with you. I am unworthy of all the kindness that you have so steadfastly shown your servant. With my staff alone, I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, else I fear he may come and strike me down mothers and children alike. Yet you have said, I will deal bountifully with you and make your offspring as the sands of the sea, which are too numerous to count. After spending the night there, he selected from what was at hand these presents for his brother Esau. And then the text goes on to say the presents that he, the gifts he selected. Mm -hmm. um, so the way I see it here, there, right, he's very scared. He's greatly frightened. He's very, you know, he, anxiety, anxiety is not even, um, yeah, it's anxiety, but it's like more than anxiety. Um, he's afraid for the lives of him and his family. Um, and he, the way I see it, he has three, he has three separate, three responses, um, if you like look at it in order. So what is, what is his first response to being, to this really, you know, Horrible, horrible, horrible fear for his life. It's not prayer, right? What is his give presents his to the, his brother? No, that's the third response. Oh, we'll that's the third there. one. That's the third. What's his first response? He divided the camp. Exactly. So, so like, what would you say? Someone. Exactly. So, like, what would that like? You know, just symbolically like what would you call that like what what's he worrying about here not about praying I mean he's not his first act is not to pray but to like how would what did you say that strategize strategize and to what end though like what is he well probably to save his family and save some remnant that could continue yeah exactly yeah. I mean but I was I thinking that. that he had so much in terms of cattle and wealth that he didn't need his brother to give him anything, that he just wanted them to be separate but equal. Well, but he's separating here. He's separating. He's he's afraid that his, bro like his brother is going to come and kill everyone. So he says, if I separate into two camps, he'll only kill, <laughs> at least the other camp will survive, right? Like, like what I would call this, so there's this book that I'm going to be quoting from. I just want to show it to you so I get the names right. Um, Rabbi Yassi Fruman, who is um, whose son, who is the son of um, Nachum Fruman, who's a very famous rabbi, and Omran Kleiman, who was a uh, some I'm not sure a psychologist, social worker, put together this book of sources, and they describe here the different. I liked how they how they define the different stages. At the first stage, with this great fear, the first response is survival instinct, right? Like he. He's strategizing, like my dad said, he's like strategizing in order to survive, or at least in order to some of them will survive, right? So like before he can even like think about praying, his first response is just to do what he can to ensure survive, at least to ensure that part of his family will survive, um, which I think is like also very important to think about in our, I think right now, we're, to a large extent, people are praying but to a large extent like very focused on this first stage of survival like just doing what you know we're, we're very scared we're doing doing what we can to 
to survive as a, the people of Israel. Um, okay, and then the second, what's the second response? So it's only, and it's only after that, sometimes like when something happens like this, prayer maybe isn't the first response, right? The first response is survival, and then the second response is the prayer. Um, and what, and what is the form of his prayer? Like, what are the different parts of his prayer? Anyone, anyone want to like divide it up? What are the, the, what are the different parts of his prayer? What are the different elements of the prayer? Right, starting from here, oh God of my father. Um, coming up from the chat is Ellen Rothberg who said humility. Humility, yeah, that's great. Right. He starts with humility, right? Before he even gets to the point of, of asking, right, of the deliver me, I pray, he starts with humility. Yeah, I like that way of putting it. Um, and even before humility, what does he start with? Right? He says, he, he says, said, remember, remember my father, <laughs> remember. Abraham. Yeah, yeah, he's relating to God as the God of his father, of his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac, right? So he's starting from that connection, that very personal family family connection. Um, yeah, he's yeah. also remember it, reminding God, you know, you made me a promise. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You made a promise to them, and yeah. Um, okay, so he starts with that, and then he goes on to the humility. I like how Ellen, Ellen, right? Ellen said, uh, "Return to." Um, um, sorry, I am unworthy of all the kindness they have so steadfastly shown your servant. Right, humility, like I'm not deserving. Um, but on the other hand, right, he's also acknowledging all the kindness. Right, he is that he has received. Like he used to be at this point, and now he's at this point. He, you, he, he crossed um, when he first left Israel. Right, he had only his staff alone. He crossed the Jordan, and now he's two camps and with tons of animals. And you know, and he's wealthy, and he has lots of a huge family. Um, so he also starts from like almost a place of thankfulness in some ways, right? Like I'm, he's being humble, but he's also, and he's acknowledging the kindness. Yeah, Janice. Um, when I had originally said, you know, all his wealth, he was showing his brother and that he didn't really mm. need his brother's largesse. Right. Um, it says here, I send this message to my Lord in the hope of gaining your favor. So I think that yeah. was his first strategy. Mm, to, that's true, right. Even before know, kind he had to see... Right, exactly. He had to see. Yes, yes. You're right. You're right. That was yeah. even right. Even before, even before he went into the survival, the because before he wasn't, he wasn't even sure whether he needed to be scared or not. Right. 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 So yes, yes, exactly. That's and when when I read the line, um, I fear he may come and strike me down, mothers and children alike. I yeah. thought of what Hamas did. Yeah, of course. Who could read it and not think of that? Yeah. Yeah. His fear is exactly what happens. What yes. exactly what happened to us? Um, yeah. So then he. So then. So, like Janice is saying, then he moves in from this, this very deliver me. I pray from the hand of brother, from the hand of Asa. Else I fear he may come and strike me down, mothers and children. Like he's like, he expresses his fear, like as a, you know, in its worst possible form. Um, which hasn't happened to him yet, right? It's different than our situation, which hasn't happened to him yet. Um, and he, you know, prays to God to save him. Um, uh, to, yeah. Um, and then he ends, he ends sort of, yet you have said, I will deal down to, bountifully with you and make your offspring as the sands of the sea, which are too numerous to count. So he sort of ends with the promise, right? Like the hope for the promise of what could be. And then how would you look? And then the last sentence, how would you, right? He we went through the survival, then he had then he gave his prayer, and that and only then does he give these presents to his brother Esau. Like what what would you see as this third, this third stage? What's going on here? I think that an assumption is made by um, Jacob that he's gonna survive, that he's gonna come through this. Right. He certainly seems more confident, right? If he's giving yeah, that yeah. way. So the way that um, Rabbi Fruman puts it is that this is like more creative. Like 
after he like after he prays, he sort of has the strength to come up with something that's like not just survive, not just worried about his own survival, but like trying to think ahead, think creatively, like how can I like face this conflict? Um, and it's a good point. Like it does seem like he's like a bit more optimistic at this point. Like maybe that's what gives him the, you know, the the ability to be more to more to be more creative and to think of to think of some other way of moving forward. Um, so, right, so the way Rabbi Freeman put it is like, this is like the creative, um, after he prays, he has the strength to have this, think of this more creative solution. Um, okay, so I wanna look at all these different stages of it, but before that even, I wanted to just like have a very short, listen, just a minute, because there's, Sometimes music can really like express things in ways that we can't in words. And I just wanted to very, hopefully it will work. Listen, I'm sure probably many of you know this song, but the Yonatan Rozelle puts his prayers to Jacob's prayer to song. So I just wanted to listen to it together for, we won't listen to the whole thing, but just, just to hear it. Um, um, just yeah. one thing, Rachel, make sure you're sharing your, your computer sound as well. Yeah, or... I remember I have to do that. Let's see if I can do it. Am I, hold on. Uh, wait a second. You're not hearing it now, right? Hold on. I mean, we were hearing, I think, an ad. Oh, you can hear the ad. Okay. So that's great. Well, this, is, this I just have to. Yeah, there we go. Okay. You can hear it now, right? Yeah? No, you can't hear it? Nope. No? No. Okay. Just a second. Let me try one somewhere, see if it works. Normally they say, right, when you share the screen, they give you an option. Ah, here, share sounds. Now I see it. Okay. All right, now it should work. Was beautiful, Rachel. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think he just like he really, um, yeah, really captures or the pathos of this prayer, and the, uh, you can you can listen to the whole clip another time. Um, but so what does katanti mean? Um, I'm I'm small, like I'm unworthy, but literally it's from katan, like small. right, right. Oh, thank you. Um, oh. You lost audio entirely, Nancy. You can't hear me. You a helper, Kayla? I don't know. You can't um, hear at all. I yeah, hear. let me see what I can do. Okay. Um, um, okay. So, okay. So, what I want to move forward and look at a little bit is like actually this first 
this first stage, like I actually, I've been feeling, you know, in the, for me, it's not always so easy to pray in this like first stage of you know, crisis and like fear. Um, it's like, what can we do, you know, in this very first, first stage? Uh, everyone else can hear, right? Just, yes? Okay. I don't know an answer. And Kayla will try to help you then. So, yeah, Kayla's trying to help you. Um, yes, other people can hear. Um, Okay, so 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 first of all, I just want to oh, hold on. Let's share my share the uh, sheet again. So a lot of people have been talking about this week, uh, two weeks now almost. Hard to believe a week and a half that we're not even in in mourning yet. That the in 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 the stages of mourning, right there is. Before the before the person is buried, before the loved one is buried, the person is in what's called aninut, um, and at that point, like between the death and the burial, there's no obligation. Right? Here is when a person's dead is lying before him, he's in the obligation to recite the Shema, pray, put on tefillin, or observe any of the mitzvot did in the Torah, um, and a lot of and people have been talking about how we're still, we're still even in this, like this state of Aninu, right? That there's not, so many of the bodies have not been buried or even been identified. And there's, I mean, I don't know what the numbers were, are right now, but as of like even a couple of days ago, there were still like 900 unidentified bodies. Um, so, so Maimonides talks about in the Talmud that at this point, there's not even an obligation to Recite to there's not an obligation to do any mitzvah. Like the person is, what it like is you know is too much in shock is or is dealing with the practicalities of the burial or is in just you know too much emotional shock and and pain to pray. Um, so so that's one thing to keep in mind that maybe you know at some points it's like it's just even to pray is it's too difficult. Um, yeah, okay. And, I want, um, and sometimes there are like, even if we can't pray with words, like with the traditional prayers, there are other, other ways we can pray. So I wanted to look at, or maybe not pray, whatever you want to call it, but I wanted to look at this, the verse from the, this passage from Exodus. Um, someone want to read it? Exodus 2. Anyone? I can read it again, I, but I, I, I'd I like someone else to read it. I can read it. Okay, go ahead. Susan? Okay, a long, Susan, a long okay. time after that, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites were groaning under the bondage and cried out. And their cry for help from the bondage rose up to God. God heard their moaning. And God remembered the covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. Yeah, exactly. So what so what is going on here? What is here again? We have, I mean, you can tell it's interesting, like that this is the time they cry out um, when the king of Egypt died. Some sorts would say that. Because the king of Egypt died, they had hoped that like something would be different. This is, you know, that the in their slavery, and when they saw that it wasn't, this is when they cried out. Um, but what's happening here? Like, what are what are the Israelites like? How would you describe the Israelites' response to bondage and what and God's response to them? Like, how would, what's going on here? What are they? What are they doing? Like, what is what is their response? Right? We saw with Jacob, and we saw the survival. We saw the prayer. Like, how would you, how would you describe this? Yeah, Jan. Yeah. And maybe it's desperation. Mm -hmm. I, I just find it odd that God remembered them. Right. So it's not really remembered in the sense of like he had forgotten them. Right. We see it often. It's remembered in the sense of 
notice, like, you know, in the sense of recognized, I would say, you know, in the sense yeah. of, you know, it's not like you forgot them, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, or, or maybe they kind of got complacent, like this is our life. You know, we have to just adjust to this horrible life, but it, there's nothing new. And then when the Pharaoh died and maybe the next one came in and there was, there was even more work, I was told. Um, when Moshe came. Right, that's and, also right. The work might have gotten even worse, right? Yeah, they had to make their own bricks. Yeah. Right. And and I, and like, who are they crying out to, do you think? Or not? Meaning what? what's, and what are they saying, if anything? Like what? Because I had heard they had been influenced by the idol worship around them. They, they were on the 49th level of 50 levels of sin. Mm -hmm. so I don't know who they were. Right. I mean, according to the text, right? It doesn't. Well, it sounds like they're crying out to God. Maybe. Well, right. But what How God do, you know do they think of God as? Yeah. Meaning, if you look at the text, it says this the Israelites were groaning under the bondage and cried out. And their cry for help from the bondage rose up to God. Mm. Right. It doesn't say necessarily that they're crying out. Well, sometimes um, when you cry yeah. out, you're not sure who you're crying out to. You're just exactly a frustration or sadness or concern. Yeah. yeah, yes. That is definitely how I would read this, right? There, I like how to go back to the um uh Fruman, to Rabbi Fruman and Kleiman. He says, sometimes crying out in a time of crisis is free of all religious context, right? In other words, it's not like it's not that crying out to the idols either, right? It's just a natural crying out. It's not crying out in prayer, but screaming into the night. A person in crisis cries out at times without faith and without knowing whether someone is out there. His cry is not necessarily a plan of action and its intention is not to do a religious act. The simple existential cry goes up to God and their cry goes up to God. And God hears the impoverished and listens to the cry of suffering humanity. In other words, they're not crying to anyone. They're just crying. Like they're, they're suffering and they're crying out. Um, they're not praying in like the traditional way, you know, that we know of praying, you know, like the liturgy. And, and they might not even be crying out to God. They, um, and they're certainly also not like, they can't vocalize, you know, they're in like such a state of suffering that they're not able to to vocalize um or to put into words um what what they want or need or a plan of action um um yeah I, I mean I liked how he did and that also to me feels like a very sort of accurate at least for me like description of where we're at now like it's hard to even like put into words it's just like um you know, just it's just a cry. Um, does someone want to read uh, Rabbi Nachman, which is also where this is Likutei Moran. And so, just to give the, um, so he's talking. He's not. He's not not talking about this situation per se of the Israelites and the in slavery, but he talks about somebody who like who tries to pray, who try who tries medicine, who tries everything. Um, and then at the end, at the end, when he's tried everything, when prayer has failed, then he cries out. Um, does someone want to read it? To read source number nine. I don't mind doing it again. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. When faith is so blemished and fallen that even the cries, the wordless screams are of no avail one has to cry out from the heart alone, as in, let their heart cry out to God, Lamentations 2.18. This is the heart alone crying out without the voice, as in, out of the depths, I call out to you, O God, Psalm 131, from the heart's depths, and through this, faith is able to grow. Yeah, so somehow this, he says, like this wordless scream, right? He he even says that at this point, it's without voice. It's like a scream deep inside of us without voice. Um, and this is sort of how one could imagine what was going on with the, with the Israelites also. Um, 
from the heart's death and that through this somehow faith is able to grow how would like how would you understand that like why are you saying after you try everything else and you pray and it doesn't work and you you know you try everything else and then somehow through this faith's able to grow yeah janet aronson so i think this is real interesting and it's it struck me that it started with when faith is so blemished so it's like I, which I don't know what that means, but let's mm -hmm. say, you know, your faith fails you. And so you cry yeah. out anyway to, because you do. And it's saying that the result of that crying out is that your faith will grow. Mm -hmm. So it kind of repairs your yeah. lost faith in some um, way. Yeah. Why do you think that would be? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happened. His faith fails him. He prays, nothing happens, nothing works, and he is losing his faith, like in his right. faith. And then he like has this scream, which is just like a very primal scream. I mean, it's just like his, you know, yeah. his feelings crying out from the depths of his heart. And somehow, like, yeah, I don't really know the answer, but yeah. <laughs> somehow from that, his faith after that point. He's ever like reached rock bottom and somehow from that his face able to grow. It's like anyone have ideas what they think? Like what? Um well maybe part of it is, yeah. is this. Did you get a feeling that's that some something is out there listening? I mean, mm -hmm. is is there it seems like that's the only way that faith would then grow is is to getting get some feeling of response or um comfort from the crying out yeah 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 in other words like if, if you go back to like the text right or else Rabbi Furman's read of it Rabbi Furman and Kleiman's read of it it's like God doesn't care eating God even if they weren't crying out to God he still hears them right mm -hmm. And maybe you're saying, Janet's saying, maybe they they somehow have a sense that God's that God's hearing them, even mm -hmm. somehow, um, even if they weren't originally speaking to God at all, that like somehow um they have a sense that God's with them. And like we talk a lot about like in the hot like Holocaust um mm -hmm. theology, like there's a lot of talk about like God crying with us, right? Mm -hmm. Like God is God hears our cries and he's crying with us, and maybe that somehow that able to reconnect the yeah. person to his, to his faith um yeah janet did you want to add something or is your hand just yeah. from the wall yeah rachel I, oh, yeah nancy go ahead oh sorry i can't see janet so i was just i'm and i missed part of it i'm sorry i my, my i lost i couldn't get hear you for quite a bit so i don't know if this is something you talked about yeah. but um the thing something about words can be so superficial and sometimes mm -hmm. You know, it's something anybody can do and say, and maybe it, it's only when it goes like so deep into your heart that you scream out of your heart that that's when it's real. And that's maybe, yeah. you know, that's when it's, that's truly when your faith is there because anybody could say the words, but being able to sit, bring it out from the heart is mm -hmm. something that I'm sure a lot of people- In other words, he's like connecting it. to this deepest, deepest place yeah. within him. And that that's which that's is probably like, the most the truest place, the the real right. Place. Like we talk about like one way of looking at faith is like that it's connecting to your truest self, right? In some ways. Like if yeah, you exactly. like God's spark within you is one way of putting it, but like that faith is a way of like connecting to our most yeah. true inner feelings and inner, inner. self, mm -hmm. truest self. Yeah. Yeah. So somehow mm -hmm. by by connecting, by crying out from his deepest heart, he's like connecting to his his truest self and through that also connecting to his faith yeah janice and then we have to wrap up I, 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 we have a few minutes or we won't get to all the sources today yeah i think ahead. i'm trying to discern the difference between when world wordless screams are of no avail one has to cry cry out from the the depths of the heart i mean i yeah, he's saying that there's like two steps. He's saying there's wordless screams and then there's screaming silently. But this is actually screaming silently. That's what he's saying. When even wordless screams are no avail, in other words, screaming but without words, just ah, that that we can cry out without voice. 
In other words, just cry out inside of ourselves. That's what he was saying. Oh, which inside. Is, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. is also, you know, a very fascinating way. Um, I see we just have, we have a few minutes. So I'm gonna try to try to wrap up a little bit here. Um, I maybe we'll we'll see. Maybe we'll do some of these sources next time. But um, if anybody, some of you, I think probably listened to Mike's. Um, my husband Mike gave a, um, a talk about different religious, different ways in the religious tradition gives us of dealing with fear and anxiety. And some of these sources are here. Um, um, I'll just very quickly. Um, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, if there's anxiety in a man's heart, let him quash it and turn it into joy with a good word. Um, so, uh, and there's two ways of reading this verse, Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi in the Gemara in the Talmud say, one said he should forcefully push it out of his mind. In other words, what do we do if we're, if we're scared? We just try to like distract ourselves. And the other one says we should share with others. Um, um, and Mike talks about how the Malbim talks about um, sort of imagining something good could happen, that that's, that that's one way of dealing with fear. We imagine the worst can happen. We can imagine that also something like, you know, that something good, there could be um, good things in the future. Um, but I want to also just very, since it's more on the topic of prayer, look at one more thing and then, and then we'll end, um, is that another explanation of this is that he should tell others his concerns. Um, sorry, next one. This is from the Sefer Siach Sarfei Kodesh. Yesi Chana, that's the, he should tell others. Then the word Isaac went out, the Suach, walking or meditating in the field. And he poured out his sicha conversation before God. Sicha is the word for prayer. He should tell others his concerns, mean he should pray for others. So this is also like an interesting, just another way of looking about like how, how can we possibly pray in this kind of horrible situation? So he's saying like, sometimes it's actually easier to pray for others. Um, in other words, that it, meaning it's, maybe it's, more effective and maybe it's just easier or maybe it makes us feel like we're less alone right we're not just praying like this you know i'm praying that me and my family survive but that you know the whole jewish people survive we're all in it together that somehow that can be um a that can help us with our fear also to pray to pray for to look at the broader picture like like we're all in it together and to pray together um okay it's 10 o'clock kind of brings us back full I was just yeah. going to say, Rachel, it brings us back full circle to the beginning when we talk that I forget already. Was it Rama and Rashi who said about? Ah, right, exactly. With the example. Yeah, yeah, which is exactly what's, yeah, exactly. And I love all of these interpretations. So maybe we'll look at them at the, briefly at the beginning of next class. But, um, but I just wanted to end with this verse from Jeremiah, which is also just so both, re both relevant to our class and to our situation. He says, But you have no fear, my servant Jacob, right? We just saw how Jacob was terrified, right, in this, in this story. Be not dismayed, O Israel, I will deliver you from far away, your folk from their land of captivity. And Jacob again shall have calm and quiet with none to trouble him. And trouble him is like, not really like, the Hebrew word is machri, which is like, more than trouble, it's like, you know, terrifying anxiety, like terrifying, crippling anxiety. So I just, I wanna, I wanna end the class with a prayer that somehow we can, I'll get to this point where, you know, where our fears are calmed once more and there's quiet and that, and of course the folk from their land of captivity that all the captives should be returned. Um, and, and yeah, and, and uh, thanks all for joining us. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Rachel. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Thank for you, and I'll well, stay on it. Thank you. Any questions yeah. that they to Thank ask you. that we didn't get to? And um, if you're enjoying classes like these, you can find out more about our Falsman at the at our website. I am posting that in chat. And upcoming classes include on tomorrow with Rabbi Truboff on death, love, and life in the thought of Franz Rosenzweig. And on Sunday, our Mishnah Yomi series with Rabbi David Silber 
called Mishnah in Depth, Masachet Yavamot, will begin at 1 p.m. Um, Eastern U.S. time on Sunday. And I thank you everyone for joining, and I hope to see you all next class. Yeah, thanks, so One everybody. quick question, is it the same? Yeah, anyone's welcome to stay and ask questions. I'm here. I just you know, want to be mindful of the time, but anyone who has questions is welcome to stay. And thank you all so much also for participating and sharing of yourselves. Thanks yeah. for your preparation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, Janice, did Rachel, you have a question? I just, wanted to, yeah. I just wanted to know, is this the same link every Wednesday? Do we have to re-register every week or is this a, uh, the yes, same link every week? It is Wednesday? the same link. But you'll also send it out every Wednesday, right, Kim? Yes, you will get the link one, 24 hours and one hour before class every week. Okay, Thank and you. you don't have to register each week. It's just you for the not. whole session. Right. Once whole you register session. through the course, you. then you register, yeah. Gotcha. Really good, Rachel. Really nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Kayla. Uh, Everything worked out, and then it took me. Ultimately, um, we're missing a little bit off the um, top of the recording on Facebook, but otherwise, we got everything. Sounds like people had okay. a good time, and I'll see you next week. All right, thank you so much. Have Bye. a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye.